Hi, welcome back. So now that we've had all that really heavy duty physiology, let's back up and talk a little bit about skeletal muscle characteristics. Um, because not all skeletal muscle is exactly the same. For instance, think about fried chicken. At this point in your life, you've had plenty of opportunity to eat fried chicken. And so you know if you prefer the white meat, the chicken breast, or the dark meat, the thighs and the drumsticks, because they don't taste at all like each other. Okay. If you look at your Thanksgiving turkey, when you cut into the breast, oftentimes it's very dry, very pale, as opposed to cutting into the thigh where it's a very dark brownish color, but very moist. And that's because the muscle cells in those two areas are not the same. Now, chicken and turkeys are very similar. Now, the other birds are not the same. For instance, in um, the duck, everything is dark meat, okay? But in chickens and in turkeys, the breasts and the upper wings, they were meant for this rapid flapping of wings for flying away. Okay. Whereas legs and thighs were more of a postural muscle. So let's look at these muscle fibers and see what characteristics they have, which enabled them to be more specialized for what it is they needed to do. So if we take a muscle and we make a section of it histologically and we stain it with this stain, what you'll notice here looking at these cells is they're not uniform in color. Some of them are darker pink in color, some are really pale whitish pink, and then some are in between pink color because we have like three big categories of skeletal muscle fibers. And these cells are differing in their fatigue resistance, how fast the cells contract, how much capillary bed bringing oxygen to it, whether or not they have this um, molecule known as myoglobin, which I'm gonna talk about in just a second. So based on this, we're gonna divide it into three big groups. The first group is known as slow oxidative or type one. I'm just gonna be referring to them as slow twitch. The polar opposite of those I call fast twitch, but their official name is fast glycolytic or type 2B fiber. So yes, you need to learn both the names and the numbers going with the names, okay? And in between the slow oxidative and the fast glycolytic are a type of muscle fiber that has some characteristics of both. So it's called a fast oxidative glycolytic or a type 2A, and I'm just gonna be calling those intermediate twitch. So first let's talk about myoglobin. Myomuscle, globin's a protein. It sounds very similar to hemoglobin, which a lot of you know about already. Hemoglobin is a protein that circulates in your blood that carries the oxygen in your blood, it carries lots of oxygen. Okay, myoglobin is a protein that's only found in skeletal and cardiac muscle, and to each myoglobin molecule, one oxygen molecule can bind. So it's just extra oxygen that can be used for making ATP in muscles, and the muscles either have a little bit of myoglobin or a lot of myoglobin or kind of in between the amount of myoglobin. So if you look at, for instance, this fish on the far left, it's practically white in color. That means there's no myoglobin going on. Compare that to the steak on the far right, deep red in color, lots of myoglobin. And the chicken breast in the middle, that pinkish color, an in-between amount of myoglobin. All right, so let's go through these one at a time so you understand the characteristics. And then based on the characteristics, you can predict activities of each muscle fiber type. So the first type, the slow twitch, also known or officially known as slow oxidative. I'm gonna be abbreviating as SO from now on. So these are the type one fibers. So yes, learn slow oxidative, okay. This is your dark meat, so this is the red stuff. And the reason why it's red is because there's lots of myoglobin in it and many capillaries bringing tons of oxygen. Of the three different types, this one has the smallest fibers, but that does not mean they're the fastest, it means they're the slowest to contract and they're gonna be the weakest. However, they can hold a contraction longer 
So they're great for aerobic activities because they have lots of mitochondria. They're going to be oxidative phosphorylation. That's what the oxidative part means. So it's going to do all the steps of cellular respiration and able to make ATP as it needs it. So it's good for very sustained activities, long-term contractions. So it has what we call a high fatigue resistance. So the types of activities you would get or that would be um, utilize this type of fiber would be our endurance activities such as, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg does, holding a plank for two minutes. Okay. So think of your posture muscles, those you're doing yoga poses, or if you're running marathons. The total opposite of that will be the fast glycolytic muscle fibers are your type 2 B. Okay. These are your white meat. So very pale, not very little myoglobin and a lot less capillaries going to be good for short-term contractions that are very fast. That's why I have a picture of a weightlifter here. The clean and jerk. That entire um, activity lasts two seconds. But you get an explosive strength out of it, and you can have a very intense, super fast contraction. One, two, drop it. You're done. Okay, so this is relying on glycolysis, which does not use any oxygen. So we say it's an anaerobic activity. So it's going to be using up your glycogen stores to get glucose from it. So we don't need mitochondria because we're not moving without oxygen. We don't move into the mitochondria. We don't have a Krebs cycle. We don't have electron transfer chain oxidative phosphorylation. So glycolysis is what's happening here. And because of that, with glycolysis, we're going to you know, be releasing lactic acid. This is going to be fatiguing very easily. Um, so it has what we call a low fatigue resistance. And so I gave you an example of a sport here that does that. In between the two, we have our fast oxidative glycolytic. So in between the two. This is your pinkish red muscle with lots of myoglobin, myoglobin and capillaries. It's fairly fast twitch. The cells are large, large diameter, fair amount of strength, and it has some aerobic, okay? So it's oxidative and glycolytic. So it's gonna get a lot burst immediately from the glycolysis, and it can also get some oxidative phosphorylation. So it does both aerobic and anaerobic. So it's moderately fatigue resistant. It's not as fatigue resistant as um, the slow twitch because it's also using glycolysis. It's not optimized. So this is great when you're going on those long hikes or if you are doing sprints the 50 yard dash, the 100 meter, even by the time you get to a whole lap, you're kind of like near the end of your sprinting. And if you get the two laps, you're in that transition zone between a sprint and a long run. And that's a difficult place to be. All right, so on this slide, what I've shown are three different motor units and showing the, a twitch ex example for each, as well as showing you the rate of fatigue for each. So be sure to pause it here and look at this information. Once you're done with all of these slides, here's what I suggest you do. Make yourself a table. I've put six or seven things here. Fill out the rest of the table um, and try to compare the three. Put the different names. Just don't go with slow, intermediate, and fast because you need to know those other words for when they're used on quizzes and tests. You need to know which one's which. So learn the other names, learn the numbers, figure out what the ATP sources is. Is it glycolysis? Is it all of cellular respiration, oxidative phosphorylation? Compare the speeds, compare the muscles, compare all kinds of things. And make sure you understand the differences between them. So 
when we look at any one individual person, the ratio of the slow to fast, and also I'll throw in intermediates in there, but I'm just gonna talk slow and fast. The ratio between these varies between muscles. For instance, in your calf, you have both the gastrocnemius and the soleus, and they both do the same action of plantar flexion. However, one is a fast twitch muscle and the other one is a slow twitch muscle. Okay. So that's fine. Between people, you inherit your genes, which makes you more prone towards one way or the other, and this will influence your athletic ability. For instance, some people are great at sprints. Other people, terrible at sprints, but great at long distance stuff. So it's partly due to inheritance. So if you had a, a parent that was an athlete that did um, marathons, you probably would not be a great person to do short sprints if you did track and field or to do any comparable opposite activity. If on the other hand, you are an athlete that's great at sprints, and for this space, I'll just make it swimming. Say for instance, you're doing the 50 meter or 100 meter swim as opposed to the 500 meter ones, okay? Where everything is done in under a minute you would be a great athlete for other sports that also utilize the same type of fibers. So for instance, you could switch to a winter sport like pushing a bobsled. So when we look, and by the time you're an elite athlete, you get the muscle biopsies, we know exactly what kind of fiber ratio you have, and you get steered into events for which, um, you are most, um, your muscles are most suited for. So here in the middle, this is the average couch potato. Sorry, the average active person. Oops, my apologies. The average active person. So before there was any kind of self-quarantining, where you would be about 50% slow and 50% fast and intermediate. Comparing that to a world-class marathon runner, they're about 80% slow twitch. And those extreme endurance athletes, those who like to do those 50-mile runs or 100-mile runs instead of the 26.2-mile runs, they're going to have an even higher ratio of slow to fast. And then if you look at world-class sprinters, they're going to be less than 20% slow twitch. They're going to be the intermediate and the fast ones because those are the ones using glycolysis. So, doesn't matter what it is. Everybody can be an Olympic athlete. If you have slow twitch, you do endurance training, you do long runs. If you have fast twitch, you do strength training, you do sprints. Both of these gentlemen on this picture both won gold medals at the Olympics. Look at their physiques. They are totally different from each other. And it's not because the guy on the right works out more than the guy on the left. It's just that they have different muscles attuned for different types of muscle activities. So both the tortoise and the hare can get their gold medals as long as they are in the right event to compete. So why are our best athletes young? All of these gentlemen and ladies in the bottom were all Olympic athletes from the United States. And look at the total differences in their fatigue, in their physiques, because their physiques are specialized for their fields. They are young. By the time you hit your mid twenties, your muscle mass is going to start decreasing and you've have lost more than 50% of it by the time you hit 80, even if you're still going to the gym and working out. So why is that? Well, gentlemen, as you lose your testosterone, around 40, your testosterone levels go down about 25%. Testosterone helps you build muscle. So that's why your muscle mass goes down after the 40s. Ladies, 
we hit puberty, we're not kicking out more testosterone, we're kicking out more estrogen. Estrogen makes fat, doesn't help us with muscle mass at all. Okay. But here's why the best athletes are young. Your slow twitch fibers last longer. So most of your fibers are going to be, all your fast fibers are gonna morph into like this intermediate type of fiber. And so this explains why if you look in track and field, it's very easy to see this if you've ever followed track and field athletes, you will see that a lot of them will start out with the really short sprints when they're young and they will be top of the class. And then as they start aging in their mid twenties, they're gonna start adding in addition to the 50 and 100, they start adding the 200. And it's not just because it's like, oh, let me try the 200. Let me have a third event. It's because their muscles are morphing. And then they're going to start dropping their 50s and they'll start doing the 100, the 200, and maybe the 400, and then they'll drop the 100. Okay. Um, and it's just because their muscle twitch distribution type of fibers changes over time. All right, so I hope you found that interesting. We're gonna come back. We have exactly one more thing and it is a super fun topic. So I'll see you again soon.